All right, well, we are here at BJB. This is BJB HQ, and this, of course, is Troy of BJB fame. You might recognize him from the BJB channel. And one of the things that Troy and I have talked a lot about uh, in light of some recent videos is rotational casting. And what I wanted to pick Troy's brain about is Troy, of course, has a rotational casting machine here that uh, you'll see in another video. But one of the things I wanted to talk about with Troy is the considerations for both the casting material as well as the uh, mold, the way we design a mold, mm -hmm. and the mold material. So just all those considerations because, Troy, you guys have done way more of that than I have. And of course we have some examples here. So, yeah, yeah. so let's jump right in. Just to, to start off, I know recently you guys did a lot of the stuff with the Rocketeer on the Instagrams. And one of the interesting things with this, I thought this is a good point to just jump right in, is this is one you guys actually did in two pieces with two molds. So That's right. you want to talk a little bit about the considerations you had on that? Yeah, we're gonna be casting this in a later video, so stay tuned for that, but um, okay. <laughs> But, uh, but yeah, what were the considerations on this when you were um, breaking this down? Because I know there's some of us, myself included, that would try to do this all together, but I know y'all did this as two pieces, and I think ultimately that was a smart approach. So. Yep. All right, so yeah, with the Rocketeer, um, you know, we have, as a history of a company, we've been involved with a lot of fun movies in the past, and uh, past and present, and uh, Rocketeer. Now, I don't, we weren't necessarily involved with the helmet, but it was more on the rocket pack end of things. And I wanted to kind of pay homage to uh, some of the stuff we did, and uh, we actually have some, some pieces here. But this started off, obviously, as just a downloadable 3D print um, with many, many sections. Uh, and then what happened was I actually found um, the, one of the gentlemen who worked on the actual movie it's himself, uh, Michael Poser, he, he actually came out with a book. And it was great. It was a great reference material. And come to find out, they built the helmet like this. And so I thought, well, that's cool. Well, let's build it how they did it. I'm sure they did it for, for certain reasons. And so we did the helmet separately. And then the uh, aerodynamic fin was, was obviously glued on. And when I started looking at it, I, I realized you know, why, they, why they did it that way. It's just you know, a little easier to rotocast a round object like this and having a fin, you know, you have potential for voids and whatnot. And I just thought I could deal with that separately in a standard traditional type of mold when this is really the key that needed to be rotocast. So I built basically two molds. It's a little more work, but in the end, I was able to knock out very consistent parts. I had virtually no rejects because the molds were done very well and then I had the the process dialed in and we made lots uh, several helmets for uh, our own display here and then just kind of uh, we had one as, as a giveaway of gift to our uh, our owner now when you when you were setting out to make this helmet so what what resin did you did you kind of zero in on for this and did you use the same resin for this uh, fin or rudder or whatever and as the rest of the helmet since this is a solid pour did you go with the same one or what yeah, that's an interesting consideration. So what, what we kind of looked at was what were we ultimately going to be doing with this? It was mostly going to be a static prop for a display that we had here. So I had uh, tossed some ideas around because a lot of the people when they make their helmets, they a lot of times make this out of like a foam core board or something like that and then just kind of paint it because when you have something heavy and you move it around, it tends to have some... Uh, some weight <laughs> inertia with it. So I had considered actually making this out of one of our lighter weight uh, castable systems as well. Uh, for most of the pieces that I cast, I ended up using, I was looking, I did an identical material that I did the helmet out of, which is our TC-804. Now, 804 is uh, you know, an ABS-like. It's a little bit low on the lower end of uh, stiffness for an ABS, but it kind of qualifies. But the beautiful thing about 804, it rotocasts really nicely. It's got just enough working time so where you're not rushing, and then its impact strength is something else because I could, I didn't have to worry about this thing and dropping it or bouncing it or knocking it over, and the impact strength of that particular resin meant that I could have something that was nice and stiff, not too you know rubbery or anything. Kind of felt like fiberglass almost, and then but it had the impact strength so it could be you know knocked around a little bit, and I didn't have to worry about it being a you know irreplaceable that, uh, museum piece. So yeah, that's yes. kind of why I picked that. So in the end, I cast both parts, of, uh, parts out of 804 and I just kind of rolled with that. Okay, and then the 804, so that's that's the, what, seven to eight minute working time, about a, I, I know for a part like that, a thin walled part, what, two hour demold? Um, well, you know, you would think. It actually, it's interesting because it, yeah, it has a decent work time. But you can demold it in about an hour or so, and it depends on the mass and the thickness of the part. 
Um, so we would go ahead and, and, and rotocast it. We put in three different shots of material to really evenly coat the inside of that mold and uh, build it up slower. Um, and we could have gone with like an 808, something like a two minute work time, but I had a feeling that we were gonna be really, really rushed. Um, so with 804, I was able to mix it. I even degassed it a little bit, set it going, and then within about 15, 20 minutes it gels, and then I would go ahead and put the second shot in, same process, and then the third, and then I just let it sit until I was ready for demold. Excellent, and I know you guys, we were talking about this earlier, and, and my knowledge of rotational casting is pretty rudimentary, but you were showing me a lot of, y'all have a lot of different things that you've rotationally cast. Yeah, so the one question we get asked a lot, because there are some people who will sell a resin as a rotocast material, and, and some resins do lend themselves to be a little bit more all around user friendly for rotocasting. But the truth is, I have experimented across the board. I have rotocast everything from, you know, your fast cast type resin systems that you typically would do for either hand rotocasting or, or machine rotocasting. I have done silicones, I have done f uh, flexible urethanes, which are really, oh, wow. really cool. So those are a couple different durometers. It's a little stiffer one, a little softer one. Um, and I've done silicones, I've rotocast silicones. I've even rotocast foams. I've rotocast rigid foams and uh, because they rise a little bit slower. So I can kind of rotocast a bunch of different stuff. Which one might be a little easier or, or more user friendly? That's, another, that's a kind of a separate conversation. But the good news is you can kind of rotocast a lot of different things. Typically what happens is you're gonna be looking at kind of how big is this part and then what kind of working time do I need for it? So if I've got a very large part like this helmet, I kind of maybe want some more working time because I want that to be able to roll around and coat before it just locks up into a solid ball. Because if I put four or 500 grams of a, of a two minute material in this, it's probably gonna lock up because it's just gonna exotherm so fast. So if I use something with a little bit more of an elongated exotherming you know, gel, then uh, it tends to just kind of like thicken slower. And then uh, as far as viscosity, sometimes, yeah, kind of a mid-range viscosity, it does a nice job of coating the walls. And, and again, that, I would lend that to more of a user friendliness and more of like a, you know, just a user friendly or beginner friendly type of material. But 804 is very low viscosity. So that, then you kind of start looking at the speed of the RPM of the machine. A lot of people, when they first get into rotocasting, and I did too, I, I, I thought of it as like we're centrifugally flinging the resin out into the, into the mold. <laughs> and what it actually is, is you've got a puddle of resin material, and the mold is sort of rotating by it, and then it picks it up and it kind of clings to the wall as it goes up, and it does it in these two different axes. And, and once I wrapped my head around that, I read some actually white papers on it, I figured out, I was like, okay, so now I'm kind of getting it. And obviously the resin starts to go through its you know, cure, and then it starts to cling a little bit more, and then you don't want stringies and things like that. So some materials are a lot trickier to rotocast. Um, certainly even like clears, people do ask about rotocasting yes. clears for when you start talking about shampoo bottle prototypes or something like that. So it is possible, and uh, you know, this can be a little bit more of a tricky process, obviously, so. Now this was, yeah, this is, these are really nice parts, are these, all, I'm assuming, vacuum degassed. Uh, you vacuum degassed the, um, the casting material before putting it in the machine. 100%, yeah, because the, the, the sloshing of the material in there, again, you can pick up, a, these are kind of rejects that didn't work so well, and um, the better ones have been taken away by other people <laughs> who wanted to show them off and never returned them. So I was left with the ones that didn't quite do it. But yeah, you can see like in some of these threads, you'll catch a bubble here and there and that's where the you kind of tweak and tune everything. But the material was degassed before it was carefully poured in and then we, we, we slowed down the machine as much as we could so that it would flow without catching disturbances and, and voids and bubbles and whatnot in the geometry of the inside of the mold. So it, it is tricky to do clears. It's possible to do it. You might have to accept a bubble or two here, um, but I've gotten, I've gotten virtually perfect ones before too. It just, it can be hit or miss depending on what the aesthetic you need. Yeah, this is, I mean, this is beautiful. And that color, you nailed the kind of glass look of that. Which, yeah. which material is this? This one feels a little harder than these two. Yeah, so this was, um, this is a, our, 879, TC 879, which is an, a, a hybrid aliphatic. So it's not 100% of one of our water clears. It's a, look at a little bit higher heat resistance and it's got a much higher impact. 
amazing material, very strong, but uh, with enough flex, I and mean, I can I can whack this on a table, and, it, and it's got a good impact. Rotocast is very nice because, like what you were talking about before, it's actually got a little bit of kind of a mid-grade viscosity, not too low, and certainly not too high, and it just seems to just form rotocast parts beautifully. And then the we have a longer working time version. This one's about a five minute working time, five to six minute working time. And then we've got a 15 minute working time version of it. And that's what this head was done. Oh, out of. okay. Yeah, so it takes color very well, bright colors, you know, neons and glow powders or whatever you want. It's a great material, but uh, yeah, you're gonna wanna kind of mix it, vacuum degas it, and get it poured in carefully to avoid the bubbles. Now, some, some parts you want a champagne bubble look to it. Sometimes that, you're gonna put some light on that and you want that to go and uh, light up because if you put light on this, the light tends to just go straight through the top. So sometimes you want the bubbles. So you can use that as an effect if the creative process is wanting that. Now, in closing, to wrap this all up, the, mm -hmm. the uh, a mold like this. Now, mm -hmm. you, know, the, you have several molds sitting around outside of the camera, camera range, uh, but what considerations, you know, I, about obviously when uh, with a rotational mold like the, a mold for rotational casting, we have the potential for the, the mold to flop around if we're not careful. So what kind of considerations when you're designing a mold that you know is going to be used for rotational casting, mm -hmm. what, how do you typically approach that? What are, what are some of the things you want to think about when you know that mold is going to be predominantly on a machine? Yeah. So you, you need a way to obviously hold it. Um, and the way a lot of the machines are set up is, is usually you're kind of strapping them into some sort of either a, a flat board or a rail system or something like that. And so, yeah, there are considerations for that. Um, a lot of the, the, the molds that we make, we intentionally try to figure out how to make like a nice flat bottom base for it. And then that will get covered with a, uh, uh, some sort of, you know, maybe a melamine or something that we can put, apply some mold release to. And we'll have a nice, you know, one and a half inch hole or something like that that we, then we can put like a rubber plug in and so everything gets closed up it mold released closed up bolted together or whatever it is and then this unit then gets put in the machine gets strapped in securely and now all we really have to worry about is we might have like a little rubber plug or some sort of thing that kind of screws in and uh, that's our fill our pour spout and then we can just kind of put the material in there and then when this pops out we've got a nice you know, flat bottom if that needs to be trimmed out. Um, on this particular helmet, the geometry of this had some undulating geometry. It wasn't quite as easy, so it wasn't, we couldn't just put a flat board. Um, we could have the head we done like a sculpt to extend the neck or something, but it ended up just being more organically shaped on the bottom of that one. And, um, but everything worked out just fine. Which silicone did you use for that? So this would have been one of our Faster one to one. This would have been our TC fifty one thirty fast. Okay. And what is great about that is when we are doing a, like a brush over mold, and then eventually back it up with a rigid jacket, um, we can add Dixotrope and just brush it up like a like a normal brush up mold. Um, and so we do a brush up like kind of standard. Put some keys in it, and then we go ahead and do the uh, a two part split rigid shell. So BR seventy five D is on either side. And again, you could, you could do a very similar thing even in fiberglass and whatnot. Fiberglass would be a little bit lighter and, and, and kind of whatnot, but for a, a mold this size, or even when you get up to this size, on a machine, it's more manageable. I'm not so concerned about the weight because I'm not hand rolling this around. If I was doing a hand slush cast, I would definitely consider the weight. So at a certain, certain scale, you know, that's where you need to know what materials are appropriate for that. And you know the great thing about this mold is, I can rotocast parts in it, um, but I can also cast foam parts in this. This is a, 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 I can experiment around with different types of uh, casting materials and whatnot, depending on what I need for the end product. So I've got rotocast versions of this skull. I've also got some foam ones. Pull that in. Got some foam ones like that. And so this is all the same mold. So you've got a mold that does double duty. Now, you mentioned that's a 5130F, the fast, that's like a 25 Shore A? Correct, yeah, okay. a 25 Shore A. We just add a little bit of pigment so we can see our layers building up. Okay. And uh, yeah. Excellent, okay. Well, Troy, thank you very much. I appreciate you showing me all the molds and fear not, we are going to have a proper uh, tutorial explaining this more in depth using Troy's machine. So uh, stay tuned for that. But I uh, hope you all appreciated this look at more of the considerations about uh, you know different mold designs, 
different materials. I, I was shocked. Some of the stuff they've got around here that they've rotationally cast is not stuff I would typically think of rotationally cast, like foam. Yep. And, uh, and then, of course, the mold in, too. So, as usual, I will be linking, like, the 5130F and some of the other materials in the video description, so be sure to check that out. And also, I'll be linking... Uh, some of Troy's material, some of the BJB material on the end screen. So definitely check that out as well. And as always, thanks for watching. Thanks for supporting the channel. And if you haven't already, be sure to like and subscribe.